Hey, special educators, I'm Jennifer from Positively Learning. Welcome to the Special Educators Resource Room. If you're like me, you're always looking for ways to save time and streamline your work. That's why this podcast was created, to give you the systems and solutions you need to get your time back. Tune in for tips, tricks, and tools that will help you manage your workload and make the most of your time. Whether you're brand new or experienced, all are welcome in the Special Educators Resource Room. Let's get organized inside the resource room. Hey, Special Educators, Jennifer from Positively Learning. This episode is full of quick tips that you can use to get organized. Now, I am mentioning the resource room because I did pull intervention groups throughout the day. However, this would work anywhere in any classroom setting if you are working with students, which I know you are. All right, let's get started. My number one goal and what guided me in all decisions that I made was student independence. From the goals that we chose, to the lessons that we teach, to the way that we set up the room. Now, I worked with very young students, so of course, things were very teacher-directed. However, my goal was always to find opportunities to reduce that dependency on the adult in the classroom and increase student independence. Another key factor in decision-making is sustainability. I have seen, both in person and online, many highly engaging activities that are teacher directed and students love them. I've also seen some pretty complicated behavior incentive programs that are also really engaging. And I just want to issue a word of caution to make sure it's sustainable. There is one day that a co-teacher and I at 3.15 p.m. was searching online for a picture of a flying squirrel that we could print out and send home with a student. We had gotten ourselves into this complicated behavior incentive program. This student was absolutely running the show and we were sweating it. And yes, I did say flying squirrel. So you can trust me as I share the tips that we used inside the resource room to keep everything organized. These tips really worked, both for increasing student independence and it was sustainable, which meant I was doing a lot less prep work. Let's get started. When I work with small groups, I always want to implement a rotation schedule. Even if I have a group of just four students in the resource room, I will still use a rotation model so that my students can keep that routine in case I ever need to check in one-on-one with a student that's needing some extra support and doesn't need an audience of students watching. And if I needed to do a quick assessment or if a student had some work that they needed to complete, maybe from the gen ed classroom. So I always wanted to implement a rotation model. I started off setting up my groups with a rotation board. I know that you probably have seen something similar. I think of guided reading, what we had always seen for years and years, not so much anymore. But we had guided reading, we often had three groups and we'd have a rotation board. Students were learning to see on the board where they were gonna be going next. Great for building student independence. However, it did not work for us because I often had students that needed to be in a different group or they needed to stay with me or just something else was happening that was gonna break that routine. So I quickly ditched the rotation board and instead had students self-select which activity they were gonna be doing. Now the activity choices were pretty standard. I had very low end tech because we didn't have the resources at our school. So if tech was in play, of course, that was one that students absolutely loved, but it wasn't a big player in our room. But we did have task boxes. This was probably the biggest go-to because students loved them. I was able to meet so many different needs at the same time because task boxes are just so easy to prep. There's a large quantity of them. Students could self-select. Maybe I would self-select some of them and then they could select more tasks when they finish. It was just a good thing all around. I also did independent reading. I had independent work, which could have been work coming in from the gen ed classroom. And we did have a writing station. I did let students self-select, but that didn't happen right away. We all worked on these different stations together so that we could learn examples and non-examples of how to use them correctly. And then when students were ready, 
they could self-select. Oh, I should probably clarify, when I say self-select, I may be reducing the amount of choices for that student. And I would choose two activities that I knew that student would want to do. Maybe it's task boxes or the writing station, your choice. I wouldn't say, there's eight stations, go ahead and choose, because I just don't think that would go well with really young students. Now, if a student had two choices and always chose task boxes every single day, I'd be fine with that as long as they were doing what they were supposed to be doing and increasing their independence, that would be okay with me. There's enough variety in task boxes to meet that student's needs. We have student independence covered. Now let's take a look at sustainability. Task boxes definitely fit the bill here. They are very low prep. You can prep several task boxes and all different students can benefit from them and they can be used again and again and the following year, I did choose evergreen tasks. And evergreen refers to evergreen trees. I guess they grow all year round. That's what I did for the tasks. I didn't look at holidays and seasonal. I wanted to, it would be so much fun. I do have holiday task boxes out there in the Task Box Dollar Club, but for my own sustainability and just knowing what I could handle, I would choose tasks that could be used any time of year. So if a student was working on syllables, it didn't matter if it was September, February, or May, they could use that task box. I also have a set of adapted books that could go any time of year. There's symmetry pictures, matching shadows. The pictures are things that students would enjoy their high interest, but they were not season specific. I also have a set of file folders that last the entire school year. That doesn't mean I'm going to prep them all and set them all out at the same time, but that I could rotate them, but they weren't specific to a calendar date. So I may put out one set and then after a month or so, I could switch them out. Our writing station that was set up also was very evergreen, so we could use it any time of year. The materials in that station included student composition books. Every student had their own book. It stayed in the resource room till the end of the school year. We also had picture word banks. I have a set of 100 picture word banks. I print it out once. I divide it up and store it on binder rings. And so maybe I have 10 cards on a ring. That's 10 different sets. So in the writing station, you might see a box of these picture word banks on rings and students would grab a ring, grab their notebook, and they'd be set. I did the exact same thing with word lists. And then probably our most favorite thing that we had in the writing station was mentor sentences. They're one page printables. I have a set of 220 and they're from favorite books, mentor sentences that students can trace, they can copy, they can write in their books, whatever they want. That was really a great activity. There's 220 pages. I would not put all the pages out, but I would print them all at the same time and then maybe put 20, 25 out. When the stack gets low, I just grab another stack and put it in there. I don't have to worry about seasons or holidays. This felt so sustainable because I was able to set all of this up before the students even arrived on the first day of school. The writing center, once I set up those picture word banks and word lists, we used them every single year. So at the beginning of the school year, I would just need to make sure I had student notebooks, I had writing utensils, and copies of the handwriting mentor sentences. That's about half an hour, and I'm all set for the entire year. Task boxes we would use every single year. So at the end of the year, I would just take inventory, make sure all the pieces are still there. That was often a class job or a student that was coming to visit my classroom. They were assigned that job. Maybe throughout the year, I would add new task boxes if there was a specific skill, felt creative and wanted to make one, but it would just get added to the evergreen stack. It wasn't a must do. I wasn't laminating and printing and copying in front of the TV anymore. So sustainable. Now, I don't want to suggest that we ignored all seasons and holidays, but if we did add it in, it was often in the small group. Maybe it was a read aloud or music that we played or an opening activity. But as far as the independent work that was set up in the resource room, that pretty much stayed the same all year round. Students knew exactly what to do so they could be more independent and it was very sustainable for me. So this last tip is probably the most important one, especially if you've ever felt like you were drowning in student papers. 
It's the way we filed our student work and it's called mustard, ketchup, and pickles. You probably have seen this idea. I shared it on TikTok and Instagram and I polled everyone and I was shocked that nobody uses the system because it literally saved our lives. All right, so I had three bins. I had a cute little mustard sign and it was a yellow bin and it referred to must do work. If Jen Ed had paperwork coming over, students were arriving with work in hand, we were working on something that week, progress monitoring, whatever it was, it would go in that yellow bin. The ketchup was another cute little sign in a red bin. If anything in the must do did not get completed while students were in the resource room, it would get filed into the red bin. And then the green bin for pickles was like a pick me activity. It just had some extra work. Remember those handwriting pages? Students loved those because they were mentor sentences from their favorite book. If I ever had some extra copies of that or other work that was similar, it would go into the pickles and bin and students could choose what they wanted in there. These bins saved my life. I am not being too dramatic here. They were everything. So you definitely want to think about the size of the bin, where you want to place these in the classroom so that students can put their work away. I never had students leave the resource room with papers in hand. Instead, I had them file it. And yes, the majority did go into the red ketchup bin, whether it was completed or not completed. I usually would just leave everything in there and then at the end of the week, I would just clean it out. And it was often just checking to make sure that there was nothing left in the yellow bin that had to be done, um, checking the green bin to make sure there was enough variety in there, and then I had to clean out the red bin. That I will admit. But what I did is I just took the red bin and whether papers had to go to the gen ed teacher or papers had to get filed as work samples or papers had to go into the trash can. That is all I had to do was the red bin. It was everything. No papers around the resource room anymore. I loved it. If something happened to one of those bins, I would be getting in my car at midnight and driving to Walmart or whatever was open to replace it. They were that important to us. Those were the tips that worked for us and you can pick and choose which ones you wanna try out in your own classroom. They definitely met the requirement for increasing student independence. They were sustainable. They were also very joyful. These were the activities that rose to the top. Students were engaged and I could keep up with them. I think I may do a future episode on how we introduced these activities and set expectations near the beginning of the school year, if that would be helpful. In the meantime, I'd be honored if you check out Positively Learning both on Instagram and TikTok. I'm there often sharing quick PD tips just like this. You'll have to let me know if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'm dying to ask, what'd you think? Be sure to hit the follow or subscribe buttons that you never miss an episode. You can find the show notes and links for everything mentioned in this episode at PositivelyLearningBlog.com. See you next week for more special education solutions.